Okay, welcome everyone. Glad you could join us for our next webinar. Lori, I'm just having a little trouble controlling here. Let me try again. <laughs> All right. So welcome again um, to our next webinar in the series. I'd like to introduce you by means of a picture here to Vince Kostelnik and Neil Rabagliotti. Uh, both of them are presidents of companies. Neil is uh, focused on SEO and other digital marketing strategies, and Vince focuses on um, AdWords buys, and he's a certified AdWords consultant. I'm going to let them tell you more about themselves as they do the presentation. And my picture over there is Lynn Yanyo. I'm a director of the Institute, and I host the webinar series for us. We have a function screen, and so during this presentation, you all will be listening, but you won't be able to speak during the presentation. However, if you have a question, I encourage you to type it to us using the little box down below that looks like a folder with a Q on it, the Q&A box. If you click on that, you'll get a screen and you can type your question. We'll all see it here, the presenters and myself, and I will either field it as, as necessary or hold it to the end. Uh, so please do uh, type to us as you think of those questions. This uh, presentation will be available to all uh, ISBM members on B2B Pulse after this, re after this webinar exists. Um, if you have questions about how to get to B2B Pulse and you're a member, feel free to email Lori and she'll help you. This also will be available for 30 days for people who are not members. Uh, you'll get an email after this webinar is over and that tells you where to find that link. So let me just remind you all who we are. Um, the Institute is housed at Penn State, but we have offices in Philadelphia and Chicago, and we uh, work throughout the United States with business-to-business -business companies, supporting them directly. Um, you may all be aware that business-to-business -business is a large part of our global economy, but only a very small fraction of research is dedicated to advancing B2B marketing. Our goal is to support research specifically for B2B marketing and disseminate it to our membership. We have a lot of academics that support work for us, um, including some very groundbreaking research that we're going to be sharing in the fall. And I hope you'll find that useful. And just as a smattering, here's a selection of the companies that are uh, members of ISBM and serve as practitioners and uh, the ability to interact with our researchers to develop new knowledge. Coming up, we have the big talk in September. Uh, I encourage you to keep your eyes open for this. There's some great stuff being put together, but it's really a discussion around how in the, in the new age of digital and other things, are, are we gonna be remain relevant and um, drive our businesses forward? We also have an authors forum uh, going on in August, and we have several webinars lined up, nothing specific on dates just yet, but I encourage you to keep your eyes out here. So I'm going to just turn this over. Um, I'll say that there's a tremendous amount of content that Vince and Neil are going to present to you. It's really dense. Um, they are willing to take questions afterward, though, um, and so feel free to contact them. But I think you're going to find that their um, work and the things that they're presenting are, are really interesting and very, very valuable in terms of uh, validating what marketing needs to be doing in the digital space. So Vince, let me turn it over to you. Okay, thanks, Lynn, and uh, welcome everyone to the ISBM webinar on ROI in digital marketing. My name is Vince Kostelnik with AdEd Solutions, and I will be one of your presenters today. <clears throat> there we go. A quick check on my background. I have a BSBA in accounting, and I started out as a cost analyst for the United States Steel Corporation. And then I spent 16 years in sales, mainly in high technology manufacturing. I spent the last 14 years developing strategic marketing plans and project management, mainly for B2B and manufacturing companies. And I've been managing pay-per-click accounts since 2010. And I'm recognized as a Google partner and have been AdWords certified since 2012. In addition, I develop internet marketing strategy boot camp trainings for a variety of topics. And so I would like to introduce to you now 
uh, Neil Rabliotti, who I've worked with over the last year and a half, and Neil and I have been co-presenters at several internet marketing strategy boot camps. Neil? Thanks, Vince. Good morning, everyone. My name is Neil Rabliotti, and basically my background kind of started out in marketing and communications. I worked in television broadcasting and advertising. I produced corporate sales videos and corporate videos for several years. I transitioned into sales and did 20 years of consultative selling in a B2B market, always doing manufacturing or B2B environments. I developed sales training programs. I was the person that handled major accounts and developed new territories for people and also started doing e-commerce sales and strategy. Finally, in the last 23 years of my life, I've been uh, doing internet development in one sort of another, everything from web development all the way up to social media, 19 years of search engine optimization experience, I developed uh, several internet marketing boot strategy boot camps across the country at several universities, and I have 10 years of digital video marketing on top of that. So I jokingly call myself the world's oldest internet marketing person. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Neil. <clears throat> so let's take a look at today's agenda. First, we'd like to figure out why digital transformation is important to you. And then we'll look at selecting relevant keyword search phrases for your digital marketing, and then choosing the most effective digital channels to reach your target markets. Then we wanna talk about aligning your content to rank high or number one in search engine algorithms. And then we'll get into interpreting and leveraging Google Analytics to pull the right reports, create customized dashboards, and convert report data into action. So the problem of tracking marketing success isn't anything new. Back in the late 1800s, a gentleman by the name of John Wanamaker, who was a pioneer in advertising, made this statement. I know half the money I spend on advertising is wasted, but the problem was he could never figure out which half it was. Now, John didn't have the luxury of digital advertising like we do today, but in today's marketing world, there's little reason why you wouldn't be able to know which parts are producing results and which ones are not. <clears throat> so, why is digital and a digital transformation important to you? As we can see from this slide, the <clears throat> Forrester Research reports that although it varies greatly by product complexity and market maturity, Today's buyers might be anywhere from two thirds to 90% of the way through their buying journey before they even reach out to a vendor. So the question becomes, when your target market is searching for information about you, will they find you? The Forrester research is validated by Google, as you'll see in these particular statistics. Google states that 89% of B2B researchers use the internet during the B2B research process. In addition, 90% of B2B researchers who are online use search while they're doing, <clears throat> or use search for finding out information. And then B2B researchers do an average of 12 searches on average prior to engaging with a brand specific site. And in case you didn't think your target market was getting any younger, millennials account for almost half of all B2B research. So what's included in digital marketing? I like to break it up into three buckets, if you will, and I'm sure you can look at it in different ways. First, there's your website with the associated search engine optimization, which includes keyword research, competitive research, link audits and strategy, along with website analysis. Then there's paid advertising, also known as search engine marketing or pay-per-click marketing, and that includes search marketing, display advertising, video advertising, and classified advertising. But it can also include things called remarketing or R and RLSA, which is remarketing lists for search ads, where you can actually market independently to people who have already visited your website. And then there's the third bucket, which I call content marketing of all types. Blog posts, social media, online PR, newsletters, videos, infographics, slide shares, eBooks, white papers, and so on and so forth. So it's important to note that all of these are keyword based and to be effective, 
you need to select the right keyword phrases in order to be recognized. So let's look at keywords, <clears throat> which is the primary foundation of digital marketing. A guy by the name of Robert Collier wrote a book called The Collier Letter Book, which includes a host of sales letters. This book was very successful because he wrote to his readers' needs and entered the conversation already going on in the customer's mind. And although Collier wanted folks to order products, his letters were friendly and personal, and he always began by looking at things from the reader's perspective. So in selecting keyword phrases, it's about empathy. People are looking for answers, and getting into the head of your target market is key in making you a good marketer. And always remember this. It's not about technology and everything that it can do. It's about people and what's going on inside of their world. Ultimately, we are looking for what's called the bullseye of user intent. So aligning your keywords with user intent as well as your business goals is important. <clears throat> now also note, there are different types of keywords that you can consider. There's branded keywords, like your company name, a branded product or service, or a key individual inside of your company. There's non-branded keywords, which are product or service functions that you offer. And then there's even competitor keywords that you can use and bid on, which can become highly important, particularly in paid advertising, where you can actually bid on the name of the company or their branded product. So, the goal is not to just get an audience, but to get a targeted audience. There are two levels of research you can do in order to find the right keywords. First, there's level one, where you get ideas or brainstorm for relevant keywords. So you can look at your website, you can look at your analytics, which hopefully is tied into your site now in the Google Console if you've already associated that. You can look at a competitor's website and analyze what keywords that they are looking for. And often overlooked, you could just ask your best customers, what keywords would you type in when you're looking for the products or services that I provide? So keep in mind that the words you are thinking may not be what the audience is thinking. Remember, user intent. You want to be customer focused. And then there's level two, where you look for alternative variations of keywords, which may be better than what you were originally thinking, like singulars, plurals, synonyms, or any close variants of your keywords. Word Tracker is one of the top rated programs you can use. There are literally dozens of free and paid tools for digging into keyword alternatives. And if you have a Google AdWords account, you can use the Google, the Google Keyword Planning Tool. So, in searching for the right keywords, keep these things in mind. Don't just look at volume, how many searches are being done for a particular keyword in a month. Look for the best descriptive word or words that have a reasonable volume. Validate your selection by how accurate the keyword is to what you do and your business goals, as well as how competitive they are. Look for long tail keyword phrases, which ha might have four, five, or even six words in today's world, and these will typically allow you to discern user intent more easily. Don't go for over general keyword phrases. They may be too broad and can cause much unqualified and unwanted traffic. Avoid words with mul uh, multiple alternative meanings like windows and windows. Are you looking for the windows as a replacement for windows in your house? Or are you looking for a Windows operating system? Type the word into Google and see what comes up and evaluate it from there. One other thing to point out is this. Don't attempt to market to all of your target markets at the same time with the same message. In today's marketing world, segmentation is key. 
whether by industries or product or service type. Select keyword banks for each of your individual markets. So how do you choose the most effective channels? Well, first, you need to understand that marketing is a testing process. Very rarely will you find a person or company who can legitimately claim that they know for a fact that certain things will work. They can tell you, however, what is likely to work or what has worked in the past, but in order to verify whether it worked for you or not, it must be tested. If you don't see marketing as a testing process, you're gonna have expectations that'll probably be unrealistic and you're gonna become frustrated in your marketing. And I always like to say, there are no marketing experts, only marketing testing experts. So to discover which channels are best for you, you need to test. Now I hope everyone on this call not only has a website, but that you are actively using today's SEO techniques to rank naturally or organically in a higher position. Paid advertising, on the other hand, is an individual choice for each company, and although it may not be for everyone, there are many benefits to at least considering it. The testing comes in when you consider all the different types of content marketing. So whether you decide to blog, and then of course social media is popular today, or do online PR, or any of the other things listed here in content marketing, it's a matter of finding out where your target market <clears throat> gets their information. So I say this, don't use these channels because some guru is telling you to. I like to look at it this way. There are things that we do that make us feel better about ourselves. Then there are things that pay the bills. We're looking for the things that pay the bills. Strategically, we want to be where our important customers are, including what channels they frequently use. It's all about getting in front of the right people. And you can monitor the effectiveness of all this in Google Analytics, as you will see during Neil's part of the presentation. So, Neil is going to be talking about categories one and three and how to track them digitally. But before we get to Neil, I'm going to add in a few slides related to category two, specifically paid advertising. And you're also going to note during Neil's presentation that these goals that I talk about can be imported into analytics through the Google Tag Manager. So, in AdWords, there are four ways in which you can track your return on investment. One is by landing page with the associated thank you page and actually putting a code on that page that'll trigger when somebody takes a desired action. And similarly, if you have apps that people download or engage with, you use a code uh, to determine if uh, people are actually doing what you want them to do. You can add phone numbers in and track those and see if you're getting phone calls. And the fourth thing that you can do in AdWords is you can import goals from offline or online conversions. For example, salesforce.com. I put a short link in there where you can go and learn more about how to do that if you're interested. So here's a visual of what it'll look like inside of the Google AdWords interface. So when you set up tracking, you would need to select the most appropriate category for you. Tracking on paid search is relatively simple, but in order to do that, you must know your numbers. In the interface, you'll be able to see how much money you've spent in a given month. And if you're using tracking, you can see how many inquiries you get, and then if any of them are converted into paying customers. Then ask, what is the value of each new customer to me? How often does the typical customer order from me? What is my customer retention rate? How long do customers tend to stay with us or do they jump around their lot? And ultimately, what is the lifetime value of a customer? So here's a quick example that I have for you. If you look at the interface and you see how much money that you spent in your paid search last month and say it's $2,000. 
if you're tracking everything and you know that you got two new customers and then you apply your numbers if each new customer is worth fifteen hundred dollars to you they typically order from you two times a year they hang around with you or stick with you for five years all of a sudden the lifetime value of those customers for the two thousand dollar spend today becomes fifteen thousand dollars and so i'm going to leave you with one final thought keep in mind that you can use paid search to test keywords messages and landing pages before you invest in them from a search engine optimization standpoint that's it for me and i'll hand it over to neil well, thanks, Vince. What I want to do now is talk about how do we align all of our content, both website and articles and all that, with search engine algorithms. And what we want to take a look at here, and uh, there we go. You have to understand that no matter what we're talking about, everything that has to do with search engine optimization is about relevancy, relevancy, relevancy. So we're talking about four key areas content the actual physical text that you put on a web page codes these are you know you hear the, the term the magic codes or the meta tags these are important because they help align the website with what google's looking for and other search engines are looking for to evaluate and help organize the content and in what what ranking they put them user engagement this is two primary areas one is how many people link to your content from the outside world linking to you as well as how many people are coming into your site and actually looking at things and utilizing it. We'll touch base on that in just a minute. Finally is structure. Is the content and the website and the articles and the social media we're doing, are they able for Google to access those pages or have we put things in place that maybe block Google from seeing that? We're not gonna talk so much about that, but we're gonna focus on the content codes and user engagement. So when we talk about the content, we're talking about the physical words on a page. And this is where there's a bit of a conflict because as marketers, especially in business, we're always told to be concise, get to the point, and use a lot of pictures nowadays. Well, it's still important to do that. And I don't want you to understand that I think you should put a giant block of a thousand words on a page. But you do have to understand it's a, it's a nice balance. But you do need to have at least 250 words minimally on a page even to get Google's attention. It's not uncommon for really high competitive phrases to have upwards of 1,200 words on a page. But again, it's not one big block. It's mixing it in, it's, it's mixing it in with photos so that it reads more like a magazine article versus just a giant block of text. It's important that the keyword phrase should be the most dense phrase used on the page. That makes it stand out. On average, it's about 2.5 to 5% is how many times it's actually used in the body copy. If you use it too little, it's not going to be relevant enough to compete with other web pages. But if you go too far over the edge, well, you might be able to get the, the, the ranking, but the problem is it's not going to be readable to people when they come to your website. You need to bold the keyword phrase at least once per page or at least once in every article that you submit. And also make sure that the keyword phrase is at the beginning and at the end of the content because that tends to be where all the search engines team seem to focus on where they're actually looking at those things. So we talk about these codes, and I always kind of laugh because everyone talked about the quote magic tags, the meta tags. And I was actually at a conference in Chicago about probably seven, eight years ago, and I actually had the opportunity to meet some of the people from Stanford University. Google uh, began from uh, two college graduate students that started the whole algorithm process. And we actually had a chance to meet some of these people and ask them, how did you actually, you know, what's a page title? What do these actually mean as part of the algorithm? And they said, well, we have to understand, we based it on the, when we were grade papers for professors and all that. So we look at things like a page title, for example, is the cover sheet of your web page or of your article or anything you submit. So when you wrote a paper in college, you know, you had a cover sheet. What did that cover sheet talk about? Did it have your phone number and your, and your, and your web address? No, it had what the page was about. So it was very relevant to the keyword phrase being shown up. Now you don't generally see the page title, it's kind of hidden off site, but it's very, very important to search engine because that's the first thing they look at. Next is the description tag. Again, you don't see it physically on your web page. It's kind of buried in the background. But when you go to a search engine results page, you notice that there's a link that takes you to the page and then there's like two sentences underneath. That's your description tag. And it serves two purposes. 
first purpose is to align it so that the keyword is in, re in relevancy to the word being searched upon. But secondly, is writing compelling copy that takes over to make sure people want to come into your site. So you have to describe what the page and what they're going to get out of the page in 150 characters. And that's because everyone that gets that search page reads those little sentences and determines whether they pick you or pick one of your competitors on page one. The header tag is almost basically the same thing as a page title, but it's more visually descriptive on a page. You'll see it as being like bigger, bolder text generally towards the top of a page. Now, it's important because there are header tags H1 through H6. The ones we're looking at here is every single page of your site or content should have at least, or should have only one H1 tag. And it should be that because that is where your keyword phrase should also be associated so that it builds the relevancy of the entire page. Images on a page. Love putting images. They're very important because they bring a visualization, but they can't be read by Google. Time and time again, I hear people saying, oh yeah, Google has the ability to read images. They do not at this time have the ability to read images. So the way we get around that is we can associate a keyword tag to an image placed on a title on a page or in a content or article or website. Uh, the alt image tag allows us to type in an attribute that gets associated with the image so that when Google sees the image, it associates it with a keyword phrase. Again, building to the relevancy. So if you notice all these things have in common, page title, description tag, header tag, and alt image tag, you all have your keyword phrase as being the beginning of every single one of those tags. That's what helps establish relevancy for each and every page of your website and each and every article and posting you put in your social media. Now, the last one I kind of find is funny is the keyword tag. The keyword tag was always, you know, you'd think that'd be the place where everybody puts everything. And it was back in 1994 and 1996 and 97. But the problem is everybody started gaming the system. They realized you could get to number one by just putting all your words in there and having very little content on the pages. Google saw that people were gaming the system, so they actually stopped using it well over 10 years ago. And to be honest with you, Yahoo, Bing, all the other ones, they don't use it either. But it troubles me how many times I keep hearing marketing agencies, ad agencies, uh, website companies, and all that saying, oh, we're going to put the keyword tag in there. And it, it, doesn't, it, it shows that you're not keeping up with technology because it doesn't really add anything to the page. Next, we're going to talk about link popularity. These are not links that you put to other people's websites, just the opposite. Links, if you ask Google, what is a link? They're going to tell you it's an electronic footnote. So remember when you wrote papers back in college, you would tend to reference somebody else's body of work by putting a little footnote at the bottom. Well, that's what essentially the thought process was for a link. It's somebody else saying that your site is a source of reference and they're making a link to you. So there's two things to look at, is the type of link and where the link came from. Type of link is, if it's a graphic link, I know a lot of people, your, your corporate logos, you know, if you click the logo, it takes you to your site from maybe a business director or something, and that's fine, it is a link. But like we said, graphics don't tend to show up very well on, uh, you know, graphics don't tend to show up very well uh, for search engines and even putting an alt tag in it doesn't give it the same value as actual text. So the next type of link would be a text link. That's great because a text link has physical text, but in many cases, it's just your web address, which again, it's better than graphic, but it's not as good as the final one, which is a link that has anchor text in it. So if you were to have something on there that say like latex paint for interior walls, and that was the word, and when you click that, it took you to your website about latex paint, that's perfect because you've got the keyword associating with your website. This is why so many people use social media and they use uh, blogs and article publishing because it not only can see the word, but the words around it. So that gives you the highest form of what we call link juice or the value of the link coming from the outside world coming into your site. And that helps propel yourself up into the search engines. Now, link sources is where everything's coming from. And that basically is trust, relevancy, and ranking. Trust means that the site linking to you hasn't violated Google's, um, any of their policies or, or, or best practices. They've been around for a while. Relevancy means it makes sense that they made a link to you. If I own a machine shop and I get a link from a machining institution, well, that makes sense because that would be a relevant contact. However, if I'm a machine shop and I get a link from a pizza shop down the street, well, that's not really that relevant. And Google knows that and they can actually kind of see that. So that gets, again, it's a link, but it doesn't have much value to it. Or in the industry, we call it link juice. The final thing is ranking. 
the sites that rank that link to you should also do well in the search engine because that passes that power of their ranking gets kind of forwarded onto your website and it can make the difference between being on page five and being on page one. Now this also goes not only true just for websites, but also for social media and SEO. Now I also do a lot with video, so I'm gonna show you some other user engagement that becomes really important, especially when you're talking about videos on YouTube. If you'll notice the areas highlighted in red, the first thing Google looks at when they see a page like this is they look down at that number 1786. That's the number of people that have viewed that. So that means people that have physically watched the entire video. That's engagement level number one. They also look at, well, how many people gave it a thumbs up or thumbs down? Not that many people do that. So when people do that, it's considered an extended value of engagement or a higher level of engagement. Same thing as if you click the add to and add it to your favorites, if you make a comment, or if you subscribe to something. All of these in combination are what help propel this up, not only in YouTube or in the social media of your choice, but in a case like with video, this can actually propel it into Google standard results which means you're getting real bang for your buck when you, when you start getting into uh, search engine optimization. So we're gonna talk about Google Analytics because this enables your digital marketing to generate real leads and sales. And there's a lot of things you kind of have to take a look at on something like this. First of all, the value of analytics. You know, I was in sales for, for well over 20 years and it's difficult to figure out whether your brochures were working, your mailers were working. You kind of didn't have that ability to track everything. Well, in a digital world, every single action and step can be tracked, recorded, and when it's recorded and combined, it can be segmented, and we can see what's working and what isn't working, and it really fills in a lot of the gaps, so it's much better than it was in the past days. The value of analytics is because, because we can track users in our website and our social media and everything, we gain data, but more importantly, we gain insights. How did we get users acquired to coming into our, into our content and our website? Was it through search? Was it through Facebook or email? How do they behave when they come into the site? Which pages generated interest and which pages didn't interest and which pages actually made people leave the site? We can gain important insights into both customers and our digital content by using analytics. The insights we get is the purpose of analytics is not just to see superficial data dashboards that look nice and make us feel kind of good about things, but we use it to build the profile of our target customers. Because if we understand them and can track what they like and dislike, we can better attract, engage, and convert these prospects into actual customers. We also use it to gain insights if our advertising and digital marketing is paying off. But more importantly, we can see not only did they come to our site, did they convert into actual buyers. We have that ability to tie those things together. So in answer, this is where you start seeing the real return on your digital marketing investment. So highlights are what attracts them or gets their attention, you know, social media, pay-per-click, articles. How do they process the information? You know, in B2C, it's kind of a simple thing. You know, in B2C, it's, you know, they buy something. There, goal made. In B2B, we all know it's a much, much more complicated sales cycle. So there's multi-channel processing. There's the buyers, vices, the tire kickers. And, and as Vince had mentioned, you know, people are in there shopping and looking at things before they ever contact you. So how do we take the best out of that? Well, we can track that in here. And then finally, what converts them to take actions? Do pay-per-click visitors tend to convert better than social media visitors? Because if it does, we want to put more emphasis on that. We want to see what's working and how to take it even further. So Google Analytics is really nothing more than a tracking code that's added to every single page of your website. It collects information from the browser, takes it back to a program that kind of aggregates everything, and then it processes it into reports. It organizes the data based on particular criterion. Now, one of the things I want to look at is the best way to understand this and get your head wrapped around it is that analytics is just like the sales funnel. We all know the iconic sales funnel, and it looks at things like acquisition, behavior, and conversion. I'll give you a, a quick point that kind of drives this home. I get a lot of people come to me and say, well, we get a thousand hits to our website. Is that good? And the answer is, well, ask your top salesperson. Do a thousand calls, or is that good? And the answer is, it's good depending on how many calls convert to a sale. Same thing with your website. If you get a thousand people come to your website, but only one converts to a sale, well, you're only gonna get one sale doing that. So that helps set the understanding. 
And we want to look at things in three primary areas, acquisition, behavior, and conversion. You know, acquisition is the first step of getting people to enter the sales cycle. This is where we understand we're building awareness and generating customer interest is. Whoop, I'm sorry, I went, bumped it too many times there. So acquisition is basically people coming into the funnel. You know, where are they coming from? Where's that initial step and how are people coming into this? Once we understand that and they're in the site, now we wanna see, well, how are they using this information? Which pages do they view? More importantly, is there a common navigation path they use to get to the contact form? Or do they simply leave the site? This is where we actually start weeding out the people that are unqualified and develop the relationship with the people that are qualified buyers. And that leads us into the conversion funnel. Now we start looking at what are the final steps that it took them from looking at the site to actually making contact with our company. Now in B2C, this is fine, like I said, because, oh, look, they hit the shopping cart, they did this, everything's figured out. But what about a B2B market where it isn't that simple? Well, you need to set up goals. And goals could be things like filling out a, a, a contact form or a request for quote or downloading a white paper. This is where we start looking at how that works. And once you have this in place, you can start seeing how the whole picture fits together. So we got thousands of detailed reports. That's great, right? Well, not exactly, because here's the problem. 86% of websites have Google Analytics in their site code, yet less than 35% actually use it for their business. Vince and I do a lot of boot camps across the country, and one of the things we laugh at is we always ask, how many people use Google Analytics? Every hand in the room goes up. How many people actually use it? Maybe one or two hands come up. How many people set goals? No hands come up. So why is that? Well, the three most common reasons is because nobody owns it. There's still this unwritten rule that everything internet's gotta be the IT director. Well, the IT director generally doesn't have anything to do with marketing and sales. So this action needs to be owned by a combination of the two, or preferably by the sales and marketing department. No one understands in the current setup. Well, I see all these dashboards, they're pretty and they got lots of color, but what do they mean to me? Well, that's where you have to figure out, you're just getting raw data. You have to create customized reports so that it actually gives you the information that helps you make good business decisions. And finally, there's no training or support available. Well, there is, but the problem is, I was just looking online and I saw one class that was $1,500 for a one-day class on the basics of analytics, or I've seen free stuff on the internet, which really isn't, it's too vague and it really doesn't do anything. So yeah, there is a bit of some training issues on that, which we're trying to work on that. Okay, now let's stop for just a second. So we, we understand all the problems and all that, so where do we go? Where can we actually start using this? Well, the first thing we wanna be able to do is we need to understand what our business goals are. So we need to determine the ROI of our digital marketing efforts. We need to define the following. What are our business goals? You know, we wanna make money, we wanna sell product, we wanna develop a client base, great. What are the tactics we're gonna use for that? Well, website, digital, you know, uh, social media, videos, uh, trade shows, great. What are the key performance indicators? In other words, how, what, what, are the, what are actions or numbers that we hit that tell us we're going forward or we're going backwards? So once we can get these established and understand these, now we can go into analytics and determine which tools and reports we need to create the reports that will support us achieving our goals. Think of it this way. Think of analytics as a giant parts bin with everything you need to build a house. But if you don't have a blueprint, you don't know really what to grab or what your goal is. You're going somewhere without any direction. And that's really where analytics come into place. Now, I'm gonna keep talking about analytics, but I think it's important for you to understand there's been a major shift in the way things are done. Analytics, as we said, is code that's added to each individual page of the site. It's called JavaScript. And it takes about you know, seven or eight lines of script. And that's great if all you're running is analytics. But what if you wanna run AdWords and you wanna run Crazy Egg and DoubleClick and, and LinkedIn feeds? Well, each one of those is gonna have seven or eight lines of, social, or of uh, JavaScript. So now the problem is with all that JavaScript, it starts slowing down the value of the, or the speed of your website, which can reflect how well the site shows up in search engines. The answer, Google developed something called Tag Manager, where you put one, one JavaScript tag on, but then you add your things like AdWords, Analytics, and LinkedIn on the account management screen. So it's all monitored there, but it grabs everything from one set of code. So it makes it much cleaner and simpler you don't need to have constantly go to your, your web development company to add these codes in all the time. 
And three, it's the most state-of-the-art system working, so it's going to be used in the future and possibly may even overtake just analytics by itself. So it's a good investment to do it now. So we've logged in, and here we go. This is the screen you're going to see. It immediately takes you default to the audience level. We've got lots of numbers and all kinds of great graphs and all that. Very pretty. What does it mean? You have to understand that there's three things we're going to look at because this is used in every single report you look at in Google Analytics. The first thing is metrics. They're quantitative measurements, and those are the columns. Sessions, new sessions, new users. And if you'll notice, metrics are broken up into three sales funnels. The acquisition, the behavior, and the conversions. Dimensions are attributes. This could be things like on this screen, the different pages and how many people came and looked at it. But it could also be what city they came from, what, what channel they came through, social media, direct, paid advertising. It can also tell us things like what company came into the, into the site. So this gives you a way of every single thing basically revolves around these three, three normal types of criterion on there. So if we look at the acquisition, the main dashboard, this is great. We've got a pie chart, we've got some bar charts, and it tells us that organic search is the number one reason people come into the site. And that's nice just to take a look at, but it doesn't really give us the value that we're looking for. By going into the deeper sections of these things, by clicking on organic search, we can start seeing what keywords they use, what cities are coming from, what avenues they're coming from. Did they actually convert over to a sale? We can look at all traffic, we can look at social campaigns, we can look at search console. It gives us much more in-depth review so that we can, again, have information that supports our business goals. Behavior is going to give us a different view. This is going to start telling us what pages are working and what pages aren't working. But more importantly, you notice on the left it says under overview, behavior flow. How are people navigating to the site? And I know it sounds funny, but you're going to actually, when you run this report, you're going to start seeing people start taking very common paths. There may be two or three common navigation patterns. So that's going to tell you this is where people start converting over to things, and this is where you can either strengthen, or if it's not the avenue you want, how do you strengthen those areas that are weak? And for the areas that are working, how do we duplicate that across other pages? It can give us site content, site speed, what people search for, events. It gives us how people are interacting with the actual content itself. And then finally, conversions. Now, we're going to get into goals in just a second. Conversions have to have goals set up because now this ties it together. We understand how they got in. We understand how they're using the site. But now we want to understand what's the magic formula or what's the method that they're taking from tire kickers to actually wanting to engage with us. And that's where conversions can give us. There's a whole bunch of reports off the side. And these really become important once you actually set up goals. And like I said before, most people never set these things up. The biggest reason is, well, we don't have a shopping cart. Well, that's true. I understand that. But you know what? Goals can also be things like they, they, they downloaded a white paper. They joined your newsletter. They put a quote request in. And once you segment those and actually put goal values, set them up as a goal, that could be either an action or it could be a page they land on. Once you set that up as a goal, now it ties everything together. You can actually see and go through things that say, this is where they started and this is how they got to the goal. In fact, the next thing we're going to look at here is a goal funnel. Now, this is an actual goal set coming off of, a, of an e-commerce website. So you have the cart, the ship, the bill. And guess what? That's where the people keep dropping off is on the ship bill. So there's something on that page that's making me lose orders on that. But if it was in your own site, this might be they started on a product page, they got to a detail page, and then they downloaded a white paper, and then they went to the contact us page. Well, I need to know that visualization of the goal path because that tells me what's working and what isn't working. The next thing we want to look at is channel funnels. I keep getting people, what's the value of social media? What's the value of pay-per-click? Now, this is taken from an actual site. The actual name has been removed to protect the innocent. But number one thing, their number one customer directly types in the web address, and they come in twice before they ever bought something. So there were two direct links in. 1,400 people did that same method over and over again, and that equated to just buying items from the goal values we set, $50,000 in one month. Okay, the second one is organic search. This is why search is important, because the second level was people came in organically the first time, and then the second time they came back, they retyped the address in. 1,200 people did that, and that equates to 47,000. So here's where you can see that it's a mixture. It's not just they came to the site and bought something. They came through a social media channel, then they saw the site, then they looked it up on search, they came back. 
this is where you start seeing how it all plays together and starts attributing towards the final sales. Now, the other thing we want to look at is segmenting. Just like uh, Vince had mentioned, how important segmentation is. Well, segmentation is a way to view subset data for user session for users or sessions. Uh, you can use user segments can span multiple sessions, say like by product or service or category, in a date range of 90 days, and see how they behave in that. But you can also use session segments that are confined to user behavior within a single session. Ultimately, these help organize and kind of categorize the information so that it's pertinent to a specific segment audience or a particular way you, you, you slice and dice your audience up on your website. The next thing we want to look at is secondary dimensions. Now, as I mentioned, everything has a metric and a dimension, but what if we could take two dimensions? So in other words, here's how I use this. I can see what servers have come into my website. The problem is, is that I want to know what city they're from. So not only can I see what, you know, like, like I'll give you an example. I have a company that had Boeing aircraft come into their website a dozen times. Well, then I added what city did they come through, and I see that each different city, so I know that three different divisions of Boeing came in. That's important because now I understand this is something that's happening across company-wide, not just one division. So secondary dimensions kind of give you that added value of being able to kind of see more detailed information. Finally, there's filters. Filters help me exclude things. So let's take, for example, the number of people came into the website and I want to see you know, what their server provider was. Well, I don't want to see how many people came from Comcast and AT&T because I'm not going to be able to know who they are. I just want to limit it to company names. So I can go through this filter process and say exclude out Comcast, exclude out Verizon, and I can go down to those levels and give me just the data that I need instead of me spending hours cutting and pasting things to get the information that I want. And then the final thing that we can get out of this is audience data. This is so important because we need to understand who our audience is. And I get more people that are surprised by this is when they look at the demographics. Oh, the only people that buy our product are 65 and older. Then I show them a chart like this and said, actually, it's you know 35 to 54 is your target audience or the highest number of age bracket, and it can give me the gender. But here's the part that's the really killer part is when you get into interests. There's affinity calories, affinity categories, and in-market segments. Affinity means when they're not shopping for your stuff, what are the things this company takes, what are the things they look at? Cooking, shopping, those kind of things. In-market segment means when they're comparing things. So this means they're looking at travel. It gives you a good details to be able to take a look at things. You can also look at the geography, server network, and technical data, and it just gives you a more robust value of looking at who your audience is. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Vince. Thanks, Neil. That was highly informative and a lot of good detail. I'm sure everybody's going to have to go back through that uh, in a little more and take a little more time to absorb it all. So, uh, waiting for the slide to advance, hopefully. There we go. So today we looked at why digital transformation is important. We looked at how to select relevant keywords and search phrases for your digital marketing. And we looked at choosing the most effective digital channels to reach your target market or markets, if we're considering segmentation. We looked at aligning your content to rank high or number one in search engine algorithms. And we looked at interpreting and leveraging Google Analytics to pull the right reports, create customized dashboards, and convert report data into action. So here is what you need to do if you want to grow your digital ROI. First, you need to create your overall marketing strategy that will encompass the digital aspects of it. Then you need to identify the goals, the tactics, and the KPIs or key performance indicators of how you're going to measure that. Then you need to create reports in analytics to match those goals. And if I can hearken back to one of Neil's slides, the reason why people aren't using analytics, you need to get someone inside of your organization to own it. You need to get them trained and you need to get them to understand it because these are the things that are going to help you grow your digital ROI. Now, once it gets going, 
you got to conduct a digital marketing analysis, see how it's performing. And remember, marketing is a testing process, so you need to make the necessary adjustments. And then monitor how your keywords and your backlinks are performing relative to your organic rankings. And one other thing that Neil mentioned, don't underestimate the value of this Google Tag Manager. Uh, Neil mentioned it is relatively new, but this actually could change uh, a lot of things in the digital world. So that's it. Thank you for your time and attention. We appreciate it. And I guess we'll move on to questions. Great. Thank you guys so much. That was really, really dense. So. Um, I encourage everyone that's on the call, if you've got a question, this is a great opportunity to get a detailed answer because they'll go deep. Um, we have a question that came in. I'll just field it to either one of you. For pay-per-click ads, what would you say is the industry average score for ads built with a branded or competitive term? Uh, when you say score, uh, I assume that you're looking for a quality score. Is, is that right? Is it? Do they say that? Nope, but that's what I'm going to guess too. Okay, so it's probably a quality score. So a quality score is a function of uh, the keywords, the ad copy, and the landing pages. Now, in pay-per-click marketing, your competitors are going to have a little bit of an advantage quality-wise. But the fact of the matter is, is if you put relevant information out about the functional things that you do and they do, you might not achieve a quality score as high as theirs, but probably enough to get some business from it. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so I'm gonna send that back to Raj. If you wanna uh, ask a further question, feel free to type in, but it was the quality score. <clears throat> okay, I'm looking for more questions, but meanwhile, while other folks are typing, so I have one. Um, I, I used to work in a really large organization. It sounded like you were talking about them for a period of time about nobody owning it. So this is maybe a little bit more um, um, uh, related to the corporation side, but say I don't own it. What, it. what is your suggestion on the best way to get those parties together to make sure that the marketing goals end up in the right places and the reporting turns out to be where it needs to be when you know, the when it's distributed through your organization? I've actually had the opportunity of doing this with several corporations. Is it, 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 one of them was kind of serendipitous that I happened to be working with the web person or the person in charge of the website. And as I started going through things, I kind of emphasized in my discussion that, gee, this would be something really important your sales department should take a look at. And he went and invited that person to come in and said, hey, we're finding some interesting sales and marketing stuff. You might want to be a part of this. So when they came in, that sold them right there. When I started showing them, here's people who have come into your website and you're not marketing to them, that definitely gets an attention to them. So, so it sounds like um, somebody that already kind of has access to the website can drive that. One of the avenues that I, that I market my services to people is that I, I will sometimes go ahead and do an assess, a mini assessment and I'll show them, do you realize here's a list of 20 people. These people have been on your website a half a dozen times. Um, do you realize you're not even contacting these people or not even realizing they're qualified contacts? You're kind of ignoring them. And I send that right to the sales department, right? Just sales management. And that generally gets at least, it, at least peaks some interest to be able to get in there. And that's when we start telling people and through education programs like this, you need to be a part of it. This isn't an IT world. This is part of the marketing. This is where you have to become a, a part of the architect of, of the structure. So in general, is that something that you can do for people? Like you can go look at what Google Analytics is reporting, even though we might not be using it, and give those insights fairly quickly? Is that a simple thing for you guys to do? Yeah, actually, actually, if somebody gains me access, and we, we do that offline so that, so that there's no uh, privacy problems, but we can actually go offline and generally within, you know, maybe an hour, I can maybe pretty much give them kind of a real rough view of saying, you got a lot of potential here and this is what you're missing. And from there, we can discuss, you know, what avenues, who gets involved and be able to do it. But it's kind of that moment where you kind of have to have something to say, yeah, this actually, uh, this, uh, this applies to you specifically, and here's people you're missing. And that way you start seeing, oh, maybe I should be paying attention to this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I find it fascinating that you can actually help people run the path. You know, we, 
in marketing do spend a lot of time trying to help the sales force manage the pipeline and keep moving people toward closure. Um, thinking about it the same way, I think it's harder because, you know, there's very little personal interaction during this, but I, you know, if you can make people move, uh, the tracking itself, knowing whether or not you've got it happening is actually, I think, a little better than in the sales force because when you ask the sales force, is it moving to closure? Well, you know, they're very, very positive people in sales. So, you know, already <laughs> always know, right? Well, also what I've learned, also being on the sales channels, you also want to say, well, it was because of my involvement, this was the reason we were doing well in sales. Yeah. And a lot of them, to be honest, a lot of them don't know it comes from the website because nobody really tracks it at that point. Yeah. All right. So, so I'm going to suggest that since you guys are so welcoming, that if anybody on the call is interested in having a, a quick review of their site, you guys would be interested in doing it. Yeah. Definitely. All right. Oh, yeah. There's an open offer. Okay. Well, we're just a few minutes short of the end of the hour, and I don't want to keep anyone, but you all have the contact information, and you'll get it in a link uh, as well. Feel free to follow up with Vince or Neil. I'm sure they'd be happy to help you. And of course, we'd love your feedback on um, this particular webinar. I thank you so much for joining us, and uh, thank you for enlightening me, guys. I am now going to go look at some analytics. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I'm glad to hear that. All right. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks for joining thank us. You. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.